Um, welcome to our online talk and conversation with the title of the U.S. Military and Us, German-American Communities in Rheinland-Pfalz and Baden-Württemberg, which is hosted by the Atlantic Academy Rheinland-Pfalz and the German-American Center Stuttgart in cooperation with the U.S. Air Forces in Europe, Air Forces in Africa, the U.S. Air Forces in Europe Band, and the United States European Command. Um, this event is supported by the U.S. Embassy Berlin and will be moderated by Natalia Rankin Galloway. So you see Marion uh, Danzeisen, she's from the German American Center Stuttgart. You see um, Matthew Peacock, he's from the USAFI Band. Uh, William Bill Butler, he's from UCOM. And our moderator, Natalia Rankin Galloway. So these are the people you need to have an eye on uh, during this event. My name is uh, John Constance. I'm a staff member of the Atlantic Academy. It's a nonprofit institution that was founded by the Island Falls State Government in 1996. The goal is to maintain strong transatlantic relations and provide comprehensive information to the people in Island Falls on US politics, society, and culture, um, with a program ranging from lectures over seminars to school workshops and cultural events. Um, due to the large number of roughly 60,000 Americans living in the state of Rheinland-Pfalz, the Academy is in charge of a special state program called Welcome to Rheinland-Pfalz, Our Neighbors from the USA. You see the logo right here. And um, this is uh, funded by the state government with a focus on supporting American service members to experience the local life in the best way possible from day one and make it easier for them to become active members of their community during their stay. Um, today's co-host, the German American Center Stuttgart, is a very similar institution focusing on fostering the transatlantic relations in the uh, Stuttgart metropolitan area and the surrounding region and helping people from the US and Germany to learn more about each other's culture and promote the mutual understanding. Um, before we start with today's topic, I want to outline the sequential order of our event, so how we're going to proceed now. Um, after my remarks, we will start with a five to ten minute input of our first speaker from the USAFI band. It's uh, Master Sergeant Matthew Peacock. He's going to cover the KMC. Then we will move on to our second speaker from UCOM, uh, William Butler, covering uh, Stuttgart. And afterward, we will have a 30-minute moderated Q&A session by our moderator, Natalia rankin Galloway, uh, with both speakers um, before we open up the discussion for questions from the audience for the last half an hour. And Marion Danzeisen from the German-American Stuttgart will then conclude our event. All right, let's get to the topic we all have been uh, looking forward to. Um, since the end of World War II, II um, the U.S. military has had a tremendous influence on the development of Germany in general, and, um, but the uh, decade-long drawdown of U.S. forces in Europe and Germany after the end of the Cold War um, came to a halt uh, with the crisis in the Crimea in 2014 and the current war in Ukraine um, very distinctly brought back to mind the necessity of a strong and functioning NATO security architecture in Europe. Um, the footprint of the US military has historically proven to be a vital cornerstone um, in this endeavor. And in these geopolitical circumstances, the military presence has also had profound effects, not just you know, in security policy, but also in societal terms for countless villages in their respective regions with US bases in Germany. Germans and Americans have learned to live with, with each other in a very unique environment for, um, and for countless Americans, Germany has become a home away from home during their stay. However, these special German American communities have become a more insular phenomenon since the constant consolidation of American forces after the end of the Cold War. From two, 250,000 US soldiers in the mid 1980s to around 36,000 today. This troop with withdrawal uh, resulted in the closure of many small and remote military installations around the country and ended the broader presence of Americans in Western Germany. By now, the German-American communities are rather an exclusive feature of larger US hubs in Island Falls like Ramstein, Baumholder, Spangdalem, 
um, Stuttgart, Wiesbaden, and Bavaria with uh, Grafenberg, Ansbach, and Wilson. Um, despite their similarity of hosting a large number of American service members, uh, these regions vary significantly, significantly from urban centers like Stuttgart and Wiesbaden to rural areas like Rammstein and Grafenberg uh, with very different circumstances for Americans living there and for the local German-American exchange. Today, we want to take a closer look at the German-American communities on Rheinland-Pfalz and Stuttgart and compare the history and the social and economic consequences that derive from this presence. And we are happy to have our American speakers for both regions here with us today, who will give us a better understanding of the mentioned topics and will provide us insights um, into the life of an American service member living in Germany. Um, a short disclaimer um, with regard to the current geopolitical happenings in Ukraine and our Q&A session in the end. Um, please keep in mind that today's speaker are no spokespersons uh, for the US military in Europe and are therefore not authorized to make any assumptions about the overall US security policy or potential actions of the US military in the conflict. They will, however, uh, provide an in-depth look into their field of expertise and the local German-American community for, from their perspective. All right, uh, let's start with Master Sergeant Matthew Peacock. Uh, Master Sergeant Matthew Peacock is a native of Monroe, Louisiana. He is the Section Chief of Readiness as well as the Unit Deployment Manager and the NCOIC of Touch and Go, the popular music ensemble for the US 80 Band in uh, Ramstein Air Force Base. He oversees an eight member team and is responsible for all deployment, upgrade and physical training requirements for the US Safety Band. Master Sergeant Peacock has been assigned to the US Safety Band in Germany three times, from 2005 to seven at Sambach Kasern, uh, from 2010 until 2013 at Ramstein Air Base, and then again 2021 to present at Ramstein Air Base. All right, uh, Matthew, uh, we all look forward to your input. Let's see um, the presentation right here. All right, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, John. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As John said, my name is Matthew Peacock, and I am a Master Sergeant in the United States Air Force, currently stationed at Ramstein Air Base in the KMC area. This evening, I'm going to speak to you very briefly about the USAFE band history. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our, our mission and then speak to you briefly a bit about my own personal experiences in Europe with my family. So first I wanna give you a little bit of a history of the USAFE band. We are currently under the leadership and direction of Lieutenant Colonel Christina Moorutia and our senior enlisted leader is Chief Master Sergeant Jessica Wielden. As you see this slide here, you can see our clarinet section having fun at a, at a live performance. Um, so a, a little bit about the USAFE band history. We were first activated on February the 1st in 1943 as the 386th Army Band of the United States Army Air Forces, the predecessor of the United States Air Force. We started as a unit of just five members. Hold the slide there, John, please. We started as a unit of just five members, but the band quickly grew to an ensemble of over 49, uh, 49 excuse me. The unit's primary mission was to develop a way to entertain the U.S. troops and boost their morale on the front lines. In addition to performing traditional military ceremonial and parade music, members formed a dance band which performed for evening events on post, playing the popular swing music of the era as composed by the Army Air Corps' own, maybe you've heard of him, Major Glenn Miller, among others. In 1944, the band was selected for relocation to Europe, first briefly in a suburb of Paris, France, and then in Wiesbaden, Germany, where they remained stationed until 1977. Since then, the band has moved among various locations in Germany, ultimately settling at our current location, Ramstein Air Base in 2011. Next slide, please, John. Back one, please, thank you. So, as you can see from the slide, excuse me, we have 49 permanent band airmen that are stationed here. We are performing 200 plus annual events throughout the European and Africa theaters. 
We are a division of the headquarters at USAFE AF Africa Public Affairs, and we provide support for the European Command, the Africa Command, and the Central Command objectives. Next slide, please, John. As you can see, our mission, Air Force Bands, provide a wide spectrum of musical support for events that enhance the morale, motivation, and esprit de corps of our airmen. We foster public trust and support. We aid recruiting initiatives and promote our national interests at home and abroad. Next slide, please. These are a few historical slides where you can see the 386 Army Band of the United States Air, Army Air Forces. Bottom left, you see the USAFE Band when we were stationed at Simbach. Upper right, you see when we were at Wiesbaden. And then finally, the USAFE Band stationed at Rammstein Air Base. Next slide, please, sir. Here you see us honoring and maintaining our military traditions as we play a unified front with our uh, with our allies. Excuse me. Next slide, please. Perhaps some in the audience will recognize this picture as we inspire and reassure our allies with our musical performances. Next slide, please. Here we have our popular music ensemble as they are connecting with the power of music and building partnerships. And this particular per picture was taken in Africa. So. We are now the USAFE Af Africa Band. And as I mentioned before, we not only supply, supply support for the European theater, we also supply support through the Central Command as well as, Af as, as, well as Africa. Next, next slide, please. Here's just a brief overview of what all we've been able to accomplish over the last decade. So since 20, 2010, the USAFE Band has performed at over 4,000 engagements. We've reached almost 10 million people in person, broadcasting our events to over 2.3 billion people, and we've rep represented the United States in, over, in 67 countries. Next slide, please. Here we are doing our building partnerships in Georgia, furthering our alliances with that, throughout that region. Next slide, please. <clears throat> This is the, uh, the performance that took place in Georgia, and you see these are all for the Georgian troops there. And this is our concert band doing an outreach mission in Georgia. Next slide, please, sir. This is on the same trip as we saw earlier when we were building the partnerships and making the connections with music. As you can see, this is an African partnership flight in Angola. This is our um, Touch and Go, our popular music ensemble doing outreach missions there, positively affecting the hearts and the minds of the children and our future leaders. Next slide, please, sir. And as you can tell, the power of music connects. We may not all speak the same language, but when we play our music, we make the connections. It's instant and it's impactful. Next slide, please, sir. Here are a few of our local performances. The top left picture is from the Rheinland Pfalztag. The top right for the where, where the, uh, the words are, local community engagement, is the Fructala for our Christmas concert. The bottom left is for the state chancellor in Mainz, which is Prime Minister Malu Draya. And the bottom right is support from, again, Touch and Go with our uh, Bundeswehr reservist. And then last slide, the one near and dear. This is my family. The photo on the right is my lovely wife, Nina, my middle daughter, Ava Evangeline. Top left is my oldest daughter, Savannah Autumn, my little son, John Dale, and then again, Evangeline Summer. And the bottom two pictures are my two daughters on their first day in German school. We arrived last May and immediately registered them in one of our local German schools because it was very important for us to build the connections with our German friends and neighbors. So that is a little bit about Matthew Peacock, my family, and a brief history of the USAFE band and what our mission is throughout this area. I look forward to any questions you may have for me about, about what the USAFE band does, what my own experiences have been here, and uh, just questions you may have about my family and their, own, their experiences here. So thank you very much.
All right, thank you very much. Matthew, that was uh, interesting. And uh, we look forward to the moderated Q&A session in a bit, and then the open discussion with the audience uh, later on. So where you can uh, tell a little bit more about your personal experience in the local community. So thanks a lot, Matthew. Next up is uh, William Bill Butler. William Butler is a command historian at headquarters US European Command in Stuttgart, Germany. He is responsible for documenting US military operations and contingencies throughout the European theater and providing historical support and information to command, joint staff, and other Department of Defense organizations and leaders. Mr. Butler initially entered the Air Force in 1993 upon receiving his commission from the Air Force Reserve Officers Training, Training Corps. After six years of active duty, he continued his uniform service as part of the Air Force Reserve until retirement in 2014. Mr. Butler entered civ uh, civil service in 2000, and he has been stationed in Germany at Ramstein Air Base um, 2009 to 13, and Stuttgart 2019 to uh, present day. Um, so he's seen both worlds actually. So the KMC and Stuttgart. Um, Bill, the floor is yours. I'm going to uh, activate your presentation for the audience. All right, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as John has said, uh, I'm Bill Butler. I'm the historian at European Command. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of just what is European Command. I know we've thrown a lot of acronyms, uh, names of organizations up on slides and mentioned them. So hopefully I'll give you some perspective on that. And then take a look at the history of basing, uh, in particular in Germany, uh, why our base is located where they are. I'll maybe give some explanation and provide that context and then uh, share um, my thoughts on uh, experiences here in Europe as well. Uh, as in addition to Germany, I've been stationed in Italy. So I have a, a perspective in another country in the European command area of responsibility as we call it. Okay, next slide, John. So what is European command? Well, European command is one of what we call six geographic commands that have responsibility for US military activities across the globe uh, and with partnering with other US governmental agencies in those areas and obviously partnering with nations that are located in those geographic regions. So here you see the global map with US European Command represented uh, for Europe. Uh, we also work very closely with US Africa Command, which is right next door on the map, and US Central Command, uh, which has responsibility for the Middle East. So they are frequently organizations we interact with uh, in many of the efforts and operations across the world. And then most importantly, the 51 countries in our AOR are very much the focus of our attention. And then our partnership with NATO uh, is a, a strong facet of everything that we're involved in on a daily basis. Next slide, please. So within the command itself, we are led by General Todd Walters, who also serves as the senior NATO military commander. And he is located in Mons, Belgium. Uh, here in Stuttgart, Germany, uh, because General Walters is spending a lot of his time with the NATO staff. We are led by a deputy commander, and that's Lieutenant General Michael Howard, who directs this, the activities of our staff. And then across our theater, we have what we call component commands, or those commands that are uh, the focus for each of the military services uh, in the theater. Uh, Matthew is a member of the United States Air Forces Command uh, in Ramstein, Germany. We have the Army Command in Wiesbaden, uh, the Marine Command is also here in Stuttgart, as is the Special Operations Command. And then the Navy Command is located in Naples, Italy. And we also have a, a Cyber Command. This is a relatively new development, uh, providing uh, support in the cyberspace realm. So all these organizations work together uh, amongst themselves and with the other commands that I've mentioned across the geographic regions and with NATO and partners in the region. Slide, please. So where did we all, where did this all begin? So a little bit of a history lesson since I'm the historian. Uh, essentially, if you look at the map of the occupation zones in Germany, since we're gonna focus particularly on basing in Germany, uh, really the reasons uh, most of our installations are located where they are was because that's 
their location from the occupation period. So the U.S. zone comprising a fairly sizable portion of the middle of Western Germany and Southern Germany, and that's still where you will find a lot of our installations. And they got their genesis by uh, taking over facilities that were a part of the German army during the war. So many of the, the particular army installations still today were former military installations prior to the occupation period. And essentially they were repurposed uh, for the US military and NATO missions. Uh, so there's an example of Robinson Barracks located here in Stuttgart. And I th think you'll still find a lot of them. There were some changes with other installations uh, in the in Germany in particular. And a lot of that was initially because of operational reasons. And if you'll click the slide, John. So on the left is a map of what we, uh, NATO and the United States military and our partners anticipated would be a potential attack by the Soviet Union during the height of the Cold War. And if you look at those larger areas, those arrows uh, and where they're focused, that would be from a military operational perspective where we would need to concentrate our installations and capabilities. So really that kind of drove a lot of why we had things located where they were and what types of organizations were there, what kind of uh, capabilities would they bring. Uh, one interesting point about the Air Force installations, because I'm uh, fairly familiar with those, uh, many of them were built right as the Cold War began, and most of them were built in the Rhineland Faults uh, because the Rhine River was providing a little bit of uh, depth uh, in, the, in front of what was anticipated to be this attack from the Soviet Union and their partners. So those installations were built in the 1950s, and that's where you see a lot of them stemming from uh, that period as opposed to being pre-World War II locations. So all this activity obviously has a lot of military uh, footprint across Germany, but also during this period, something to consider uh, that was important to the U.S. service members was housing and facilities for family members. This was something actually that was granted quite early uh, during occupation, family members were allowed to come over as early as 1946, when it was still very much occupation focused. And there was a lot of attention paid to constructing facilities and providing services for them. And then as we expand during the Cold War, obviously we have more family members coming over and that map on the right depicts kind of an explosion of housing that was developed in Western Germany in the US area uh, during that period of time. So in addition to the military facilities that were already existent, there was a lot of attention paid towards building these family facilities and then all the attendant services for them. So that's kind of a general context of where everything was at the height of the Cold War. And that's really kind of where we start from for everything that comes afterwards. If you'll click the slide, please, John. So here's a graphical representation of the, of the numbers of military personnel uh, in Europe as a whole, uh, it does not depict civilians, it does not depict uh, dependents, but it kind of gives you an idea of where the peaks were uh, throughout the Cold War period and then how drastically uh, we have reduced those numbers in the decades since the end of the Cold War. Uh, John alluded to that at the beginning of our presentation. So obviously with all those personnel going away, then the installations are closing because we don't need them anymore. Host nation military is also drawing down to this uh, end of the Cold War period. So this is why you see so many of those installations closing. And uh, simply put, a lot of the installations are where they are today. Uh, and this might be a question we address a little bit later um, because the organizations that were going to carry on with whatever functions were going to remain in Europe uh, were located there. And that's kind of the simple answer for that. But we can talk more about that if there are questions. And that's kind of the big picture of everything here in Europe. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been a historian in the US military for over 25 years, both in uniform service and as a civilian. And then I've been over here in Europe three times. Uh, so I have kind of a, a broad picture on all that activity uh, that's happened uh, since the end of the Cold War. That's all I had. Back to you, John. All right. Thanks a lot, Bill, for the historic perspective on the U.S. military presence here in Germany. I think that was uh, very interesting. 
<clears throat> so um, uh, we're going to head to our uh, fantastic moderator for the evening. That's, uh, as I said before, Natalia Rankin Galloway. Natalia is a military spouse and lecturer with the German American Center in Stuttgart. She holds a BA from Boston College and two MAs from Georgetown University. And Natalia will take over from here for the moderated Q&A session and then for the Q&A session with the audience. And to the audience, if you later on have a question, please type it in the chat. We have a moderated chat and then we're going to pick um, some questions out of it. So, um, Natalia, the floor is yours uh, for the moderated Q&A session with Bill and Matthew. Have fun. Thank you so much, John. So that was really interesting to hear from both of you. Thank you so much. I think that gives us a really great overall perspective, both to get the broader vision from Bill and also to look at the very unique uh, mission of the band and what it does. Um, I'm going to start with just a question for Bill, if I may. Bill, you were talking about sort of the drawdown in forces after the Cold War. Could you talk to us a little bit about kind of how those decisions are made, like why certain bases remain and certain bases uh, go away? Uh, you mentioned it has to do with needs. Um, could you speak a bit more about that? Absolutely. Uh, I think the simplest answer is as we, we, I say the US military also in conjunction with NATO are evaluating, you know, what, what is it we're anticipating doing in this post-Cold War period? And we're talking 1991, 1992, uh, and they're making decisions about, this is what we anticipate we're going to need. These are the capabilities we're going to need. Uh, and then looking at those installations that would support that, obviously um, focusing on a command echelon, say, as European command here in Stuttgart or in USAFE uh, in the Ramstein area and the Army headquarters, which was then located in Heidelberg, you know, those would be installations that were going to probably stay. So those are fairly easy decisions, I think, to make. The harder ones probably came uh, in some of the outlying facilities, you know, what, what was going to be consolidated in certain places, what are large investments, because uh, obviously there's a lot of infrastructure out there. Uh, Grafenbeer is a very important training location, so that's obviously a facility to consider keeping. Um, so many, many factors going into that. Budgets obviously being slashed at that time period. Uh, so what can you keep uh, on a little bit less money? Uh, so many, many factors kind of going into those decisions. And probably the most, uh, another simple answer for it is too, we're not going to be building anything new. We're going to be keeping what we have. Um, so that's another consideration. So I think that's, you see those decisions being made uh, across that period of time. Big, big impacts on the surrounding communities, of course, when those decisions are made as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'd like to switch to Matt, if I could. So Matt, you mentioned in your talk that your first um, time that you came to Germany was in 2005. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that first foray into Germany? What was life like for you at that time? And how has it changed on your subsequent deployments? Or not deployments, your subsequent times in Germany? Sure. Yes. So I came back, uh, I originally came in 2005, like you said. I was a young uh, three-striper, just just had little three-stripes over here. Um, much much younger, a lot less gray and white here. Uh, I was single, and I was just really excited about coming to Europe and seeing what all the Air Force was doing here. Uh, so the first two, that, that assignment was only a two-year assignment, and we were extremely, extremely busy. Um, when I arrived, I think I was here for maybe two weeks and then was on a plane headed to Turkey to support the, um, the commander for the United States Air Forces in Europe. So very, very busy operationally, and I blinked, and that two-year assignment was over. I left, I went to Alaska and was stationed there for three years. The last year of that assignment, I got married, and then we came back to Germany. So I now had four stripes on my shoulder. I'm a newlywed, and my wife uh, is a, at the time, was a travel writer, and so it was a wonderful opportunity for us. We moved into a small village um, called Moschbach. It's in the, uh, the Falzerwald area, and we absolutely loved it there. We had just fantastic relationships with all of our neighbors. We were one of maybe five or six families that lived in that village, 
and we lived in a townhouse, the house that we we shared the wall with, the couple there just became our, our Oma and Opa, and they were just, they were fantastic. Our, our middle daughter, her name is Evangeline, but we call her Ava, and we call her Ava because of our neighbor's daughter, whose name was Ava. So we built that relationship and just absolutely loved them. They were so close to us. Um, we left in 2013, did some more adventuring. We went to Japan for almost six years, and that's when my little Ava was born. Left Japan in 2019, went to Texas for two years, and we welcomed my son. Came back here, and here I am now, six stripes on my shoulder. I don't know if I'm any wiser, but I'm definitely older. Um, a lot, a lot more gray and whites on the side, but uh, very excited to be where we are now. We live in Beshofen. And just so excited and thrilled to have our children now participating in the German schools and learning yet another language and just learning so much more about the world. Absolutely. Um, and before I shift back to Bill with a question, I just wanted to follow up. The the choice to live, as, as they say, out on the economy in the village that you lived in, um, how does that contrast with the experience of some other military families that might not make that decision, that choose to kind of live and shop um, on base? You know, what's your experience of, you know, why a, why a military family may choose to do that and why you made the decision you did? Well, I think that the overall why behind it is just fear, fear of the unknown. A lot of a lot of the U.S. military that come over here have have not have not left America, so they don't know they don't know what else is out there in the world. And whenever you go to a new country, it's very intimidating with the language barrier, and that in and of itself can be crippling to a lot of people. And and unfortunately, I've I've met folks during my different tours here where they will stay in a temporary lodging facility for as long as they need to in order to secure on-base housing so that they have the security of buying their groceries, buying any of their needs, buying fuel even, all on the base and not wanting to venture outside the wire into the scary unknown. And maybe here on a three or four year tour and having one their one big target being to go to Paris uh, just once. And that's, that's, they, they can check off their European tour by doing that. And it's just, that was not, I was never interested in that. Even as a young single airman, I wanted to live in the village. Uh, I actually lived uh, back in 2005, the band was stationed at Simbach air. It was air base at the time. And I lived in the Simbach village and just built a lot of great relationships, uh, relationships. I still maintain to this day, and so I try to encourage any of the folks that, that are coming to the USAFE band, I, I, I have a list of my villages that I would recommend to them and just encourage them. It's okay. People will communicate with you. You don't have to be scared and just really try to encourage them to go take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. Absolutely. Bill, from a, from a broader perspective, how would you say that both uh, the, the communities that live on these bases and sort of the infrastructure of the bases themselves can work to maximize the positive impacts that they might have by being here in Germany and, and minimize whatever negative impact may come from having this U.S. military footprint in Germany? Um, I think uh, for those folks that are coming on post, obviously, as Matthew kind of alluded to, I mean, you get out and experience things. That's the biggest uh, recommendation or, you know, just part of the experience that I think folks should not um, pass up on because there are so many wonderful things that are off post as, as nice as the conveniences are in some respect. And, it, and I do kind of want to point out a lot of the services offered on post over here are similar to those in the States. So we're not creating something different here in Germany uh, or other locations in Europe. So um, you know, if there's ever someone that maybe was thinking that we're doing things like that over here different than the States, that's that's not the case. It's kind of services. So there's a little bit of comfort in that. I think that, you know, that the, the military services provide, which is, you know, you would see at any military installation. But, um, you know, just, yeah, forging those opportunities to go off uh, post and do some things, forums like this. I know that there, my hunch is there used to be a lot more uh, opportunities like this in the past. 
Uh, obviously, things changed after 9-11 because of security concerns, and maybe that sense of kind of being a little more open kind of went away. Um, these are military installations for, first and foremost, so that's always a consideration. Um, and I, I know I've, I've heard from neighbors both uh, my previous assignment in here, you know, they have questions about, you know, what's on post. And I'm like, it's in some respects, it's not all that exciting. <laughs> You're not missing anything. In fact, I had a chance to bring the, uh, the Fyingen City Council, which is one of our local uh, towns next to Patch Barracks. Uh, they came on for a host nation visit that I think was really important, kind of getting them back on post, so to speak, to kind of do that interaction. I think those opportunities are great. And one of the individuals had been here before 9-11 and she was curious to see what had changed. And so after my tour and I do a historical tour on post and we kind of went around and saw a lot of the facilities. And so I asked her, I said, what changed? And she's like, oh, nothing really. <laughs> so, you know, so in that regard, it's not that big of a deal. There's no huge secret that, that folks are, are missing uh, on post. So, but though I'd like to see more of those activities. And I think I'm hoping that those will continue. I think those are really key. Well, there's already some really interesting questions coming uh, over the transom here that I want to get to. Um, and I think this is something, uh, Bill, you could probably speak to, but I think Matthew might always ha also have some interesting insights. Do you feel that there's been a shift in the way that U.S. Armed Forces are um, seen in Europe uh, now that, you know, we're maybe focused more on um, the role of American forces in the NATO alliance and maybe shifting slightly away from war on terror uh, time, do you feel that there's been a shift in perspective, uh, perspective or um, the way that we're perceived? Uh, Bill, I'll, I'll ask you first, and then Matthew, I think you could probably comment as well. Um, th th that's a good question. I I don't have as great an insight as, as um, maybe the requester would like. I still think it's positive. I don't think it's ever been completely negative. Um, there aren't as many service members as my slide on the, the total number of troops. Uh, showed so that exposure alone, you know, just the, the number of people that Europeans could encounter is much less. So, you know, that unfamiliarity may come a little bit out of that, but I don't think it's negative per se. And, you know, obviously, uh, emphasizing uh, connection with NATO is extremely important. It has been since the beginning. And my my command, I, I forgot to mention during my presentation, we were created to support NATO. That was our purpose when we were we were established 70 years ago, uh, this coming summer. Uh, to be here to support NATO and that common defense uh, on the continent. So in that respect, nothing's changed. We are still doing what we were created to do. And I think that's key to kind of focus on. Matt, I'd love your thoughts. Have you noticed any change in perception? Yeah, I think just staying in my lane, as far as a musician is concerned with, with the Air Force Band, I, we have a fantastic relationship with with our audiences. Um, we are a known entity. Um, I, I didn't. I failed to mention this, but the the house that we actually the house that we live in now in Beschhofen, we were able to get that house because our landlord's mother is a huge Yusefi band fan. And so when she found out that I was a member of the Yusefi band, that immediately shot us up at the at the top of her list of folks that she was interested in having. And so just having that relationship and then now having that relationship with, with the folks that live in our village, uh, there's, there's been a lot of support. I've throughout this, throughout my tours here, I've always had a, just a lot of support, even with the shift uh, against uh, away from the, the war on terror. Um, I, I failed to mention this. I, I did, I did touch on that. We support the central command. Uh, we, we deploy in support of the central command. So I'm, I'm, I'm gearing up for my seventh deployment uh, soon, and so so we're still out there using music to build those partnerships and relationships. And as Mr. Butler said, you know our relationship with NATO never been more important, right? And a fantastic relationship with that. And again, really see the benefits and the power of music when when our languages do not always line up. The the music does unite us. So there's more questions about this and, and some uh, more uh, technical questions about the relationships between services, but I do want to take a slight diversion. There's a great question uh, for you, Matt, about how your daughters are enjoying uh, German school. Um, and it, the, the, the questioner is saying that he didn't think it was perhaps very common 
for American military personnel to send their kids to German school, given that they're only here a short while, um, and how they adapt, maybe going back. And I, I mean, I know that we as a family, uh, when we were in Germany, we also sent our children uh, to a actually a bilingual school. Um, and now that we are back stateside, they are enrolled in a German school uh, here in the DC area. Uh, so do tell us about your daughter's experiences. Sure. So just, just a little bit of a, a backstory. Um, like I, I mentioned earlier, we spent almost six years in Japan. So my oldest daughter, uh, Autumn and Ava, both attended Japanese Yochen, which is the preschool. And they both learned to read and write and speak Japanese. So they, and they have maintained their uh, katagana and hiragana. So even in the time that we were in Texas, we had them tutored every week with a Japanese instructor. And we've maintained that even now, they still do that. So my, my daughters aren't the typical American children that just came from America. Going to America was a culture shock for them. So it, it was not easier for them when we came to the German school because they didn't speak any German. Uh, our, our assignment here was short notice. Mama and Papa didn't have time to even prep the basics, hello, good morning, good day to them. They, they were, they're brave little girls and they're ready for adventures. They have gone, they, they've taken in stride. The, the class, the school is all in German, but the, some of the teachers do speak enough English to help communicate with what's going on. Um, but my daughters are not the only two Americans in that school. Um, my oldest daughter, Autumn, is the only American in her class, though. So she was really in a sink or swim situation. She's doing fantastic. My wife now works as a representative for talkbox.mom, which is a language learning uh, website. And she has been, she works with them every day. She works with my daughter, excuse me, every day just on their conversational German and just the friends they are making are, are of course helping to, that's the best way to learn any language, right? When you're a kid, you have friends that speak that language and that's how they're learning. My daughter's uh, recent birthday, she turned nine. She only invited the Germans in her class. So seeing, seeing her be brave and incorporate those new friendships, it's been a lot to us and it's been difficult. Um, but they're, they're doing a fantastic job with it and they're working hard every day. Uh, Bill, I wanna just change um, gears just a tiny bit because we had a question um, which I, don't, I, I certainly don't know the answer to about the relationship between the Special Operations Command in Stuttgart and, and I'm gonna pronounce this incorrectly, the German Kommando Spezialkrafte, KSK. Uh, do you have any information on that? I do not. I'm sorry. Okay. Neither do I. Neither do I. Um, okay. So we also had some questions about preference. You know, I think both of you could speak a little bit to, uh, you know, in your lives, you know, how much you were able to articulate, I want to go to Germany and to get that wish fulfilled. Um, you know, to what extent does a service member get to choose their assignment? And is Germany a popular choice? Um, Bill, how about you? And then we'll, we'll come back to Matt. So uh, as a civilian employee, I absolutely get the choice. I mean, I have to apply for the job. So there's obvi obviously an intention. I see the job vacancy when it's coming open. I apply for it. I hope I make the list and then, you know, hopefully get selected. So as a civilian, obviously you're making a very conscious choice to come over. So it's kind of uh, easy in that regard, I think, you know, comparatively speaking. How about you, Matt? Yeah, it's 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 been interesting. The the first assignment I came, I, I had signed up. We have a system where you can choose your dream sheet. You can say where you want to go, and so I had put Germany on the on my list, but it had just been matched by someone else. So I didn't think it was going to happen. And then I got called into my chief's office the next week saying, "Hey, they can't go. You're going." And I thought, "Wait, what? What just happened here?" Uh, so it was a little bit of a shock the first time. Uh, but I fell in love with the assignment and fell in love with everything about it. Um, the second time that, that we were here, I actually, we volunteered to come back um, and we got the assignment. We were thrilled to death to get over here and I promoted out. I wanted to stay. Um, I wanted to do a, an, an additional tour here 
and I promoted out of the assignment and had to leave. We went to Japan and I spent the next six years trying to get back to Germany and never could get back to Germany. Went to Texas and thought that I was going to retire in Texas. And then due to another member being unable to take this assignment, boom, I'm, I'm back here. It was a bit of a shock. So I have lived a very, I've had a very unique career in being able to come here for three different assignments. I'm not aware of anyone else who's been that fortunate. Um, I think going back to the same question that was that you had earlier about living on or living off post, um, I think that some of the younger members, at least in the band, that it's kind of a, it's a mixed bag. You have folks that are, again they've never left they've never left home, and it's it can be nervous to go across the across the Atlantic, start life over, um, and then you have other folks that um, are just thrilled to death to come over here, and then. For the most part, whenever I've worked with folks here, they always want to come back where they want to stay. So I think it's just getting them over here to see what it is. And then when they see it, then they're they're hooked. Absolutely. I know, at least in my family's um, case, it was me. I was the lobbyist. I wanted to go to Germany very, very badly. And uh, my husband's a Marine and there are not as many of them um, in, in uh, Germany as there are uh, airmen or uh, soldiers. Um, Bill, can you talk a little bit about the different sort of cultural and economic impact that Americans have in rural areas like the Rheinland-Pfalz versus like what they how they impact areas like Stuttgart that are more metropolitan? I'll do my best and it might be some speculation because I definitely <laughs> don't have numbers. But um, my impression is that there's more of an impact in the Kaiserslautern area uh, from being there myself and kind of seeing some of that discussion before. And then here in Stuttgart, obviously there's so many other uh, industries uh, and companies that are here that I think, you know, we're one small piece of a, a much larger metropolitan community. So I think in, in that respect, we're, we wouldn't make as much of a economic or, you know, otherwise impacts if you compare it to Kaiserslautern. But that's, that's my pretty narrow perspective on it. But um, I think there's some, you know, there's some truth to that, but I, uh, Personally, um, looking for houses was more of a challenge here in Stuttgart, a little lot more competition. Uh, so in that regard, uh, than when uh, we were moving to Ramstein area back in uh, 2009, maybe the decade and a half is different as well. But uh, personally, that was it was a little bit more uh, nail biting here and, and looking for housing because as a civilian, we don't have the option for living on post, uh, say, as a military member. So we, we are absolutely uh, living in the community as we personally would want to anyway. Yeah. And I think in, in your experience, as in mine, you often have the case, I think maybe in, in Rheinland-Pfalz, where, you know, especially due to the, the efforts of the Institute out there, that there's a lot more emphasis put on getting the, those communities together. Whereas in Stuttgart, just by nature of being a, an urban area, people can be a little bit more siloed. I think that's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. not that... You know, not that neighbors aren't friendly or anything, and, and everyone here has been wonderful personally, um, but yeah, I, I could see that. You know, there's so much other stuff going on that, you know, it's not as much of a focus, I would say, for, for the average citizen, you know, in mm -hmm. the area. Absolutely. And we have a question coming over as well. In If for an average American soldier, not that there necessarily is such a thing, um, but uh, a soldier, airman, Marine, um, have most of them had a chance to go abroad? Um, I mean, my, my impulse to that question would be, Probably no. Like, I think depending on the career field, you could definitely stay stateside for all of your career. What, what would your opinion on that question be? Are you asking me? Uh, pardon me. Yes, Matthew, I, I apologize. Yes. Yeah, I, again, it's it's hard for me to speak to that. I Again, I, I've had a, a very different career than anybody else that I've I've met throughout my career. I've, I've, I will hit 20 years this November and I've only spent four of those in the States. That is not normal. Um, so I think our service members get the opportunity, of course, to travel abroad, but not all of them are interested in doing that. We have a kind of a fun question here, Matt, for you. Um, that somebody is saying that they read an interview with a member of the Air Force Band who actually had been born in Germany. Uh, to your knowledge, are there many members of the band who might have been actually born in Germany? Wow. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's possible we have kids. <laughs> <laughs> and then they come back and join the band. If yeah. My kid eventually becomes a musician. Sure. Then she'll, she'll join the, the very small ranks of whoever that individual would be. <laughs> Uh, that person also was curious about um, when the next performance is that where they might be able to see you. Yeah, that's a that's a good question too. It's 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 always interesting. We we stay very busy. Um, in fact, tomorrow night the Yusefi band is supporting the 80th anniversary of Yusefi here on base. So the team that I that I lead and am a member of will be supporting that event, which is it's it's kind of neat because I was actually here. 10 years ago, supporting the 70th anniversary, and here I am now. So as far as the next actual live public performance, I do not know that off of the top of my head, but you can certainly find our website, the Yusefi Band, or you can find us on Facebook, and we, we keep that updated with our upcoming events and also photos, videos of past events. So uh, we have a question that's more from the you know, personal side versus expertise side, but so I think you can both speak to it. Uh, what do you miss that you can't get in Germany about the U.S.? You know, is there something in the U.S. that you're missing that you wish you had? And similarly, is there maybe some things that you prefer in Germany, things that, you know, you'll really be sorry to give up? For me, I, I miss the Agatens very, very much. Um, and I always felt that it was much easier to have a day out with the kids in Germany that was fun for the grownups, too, <laughs> um, that you don't necessarily get in the U.S. as much. So, uh, Bill, how about you first? What What do you miss from the U.S.? And then what do you miss about Germany when you go home? What do I miss from the U.S.? Um, maybe going to football games. <laughs> but I make make up for that by going to Falaf Bay. And when I was in Ramstein, I went to FC Ka. So uh, in that respect, I could still get a sporting event. Um, and if we want any kind of uh, Americana type, you know, food or whatever, obviously we can go on post for that. But um, definitely when I've been back in the States, uh, which we've, we've done this back and forth now three times. So when we were back, I, I would agree with you. I miss things like beer gardens. I miss things like Sunday walks for everyone. I, I'm still amazed when I see everyone out walking or biking on a Sunday and they're not worried about going places and doing anything other than having a leisurely day. That, that's something that I really appreciate and I, I miss that when I go back to the States, obviously miss seeing some of the sites, you know, the, the traveling, which is a big factor over here, but just the the day-to-day -day life, the quiet days, and is maybe as frustrating as they can be on one hand, they're nice on the other hand. Um, uh, yeah, and then accessibility, this uh, Stuttgart is a more metropolitan area, so there's a lot more public transportation, which is not always as available when you go back to the United States, depending on where you are. Uh, and so my family and I, we kind of miss that. We can just go down to the to the Bahnhof in Bublingen and, and go to downtown Stuttgart without having to drive everywhere. So I think that's a little bit of quality of life that we miss when we go back. There, there's lots of others, obviously. We've been here three times, so. Yeah, I would say for me, the the one thing that I, the one thing that I miss when I'm stationed here is I miss my family because that's they're they're far away from me and they they're always close to my heart so it's difficult just with the distance um, and I, I would leave it at that um, but having been stationed in Texas for two years now I can say I miss eating authentic Mexican food but that's really the only food item that that I can't either make myself or find locally that I really do miss. Um, as I said, we, we, we tried, we tried to stay in 2013 and then we spent the next year, six years trying to get back. We absolutely love it here. So it's hard to, it's hard to say this one or two things are, are what we miss, but I will say that Christmas markets have always been just a very special time of the year and event for my wife and I. And now we're so thrilled to share that with our daughters and son. Uh, the last Christmas that we were here before we left in 2012, my Christmas present to my wife was Christmas markets. And we went to 23 different Christmas markets in seven different countries that Christmas. Um, and then the next year in 2013, we went to a Christmas market in Tokyo. It was hosted by the German uh, embassy. <laughs> and it just was a sad, a, a, it was sad. It was very sad for us, but we were trying to 
relive our, our, our past joys and experiences. So we love the Christmas markets. We love the, the wine fest, uh, Spargo fest, or, and it's time for almost time for Spargo fest now. So very excited about that. Flamkugan, everything. I can go on all day about what we love and what we miss when we're not here. Our plan, our hopes were to buy a house here in Germany um, and retire here. Not sure that's going to happen with the housing market, what it is now, but uh, we've our, our heart has always been here. Yes, I can definitely second that. I think that somebody who might decide to open a Mexican restaurant anywhere in Stuttgart, I think would make a killing. Um, uh, I also missed uh, the food, so certain food groups, but I think, like you said, you know, when you get into the passion for the Spagel or whatever, then you're developing this whole new palette that's exciting. And I will also say the one thing I miss in Germany is um, I have a new baby, changing rooms. Changing rooms, the babies are always so much better in Germany. Um, this, at least that was my experience. Um, so there's just a quick question actually for myself, um, the relationship of the DAS, the De uh, Deutsche Amerikanische Zentrum to the US forces. So the, the DAS exists to improve relations between um, the US and Germany uh, generally. And because they are in Stuttgart and Stuttgart is home to so many military families, um, naturally there there is some uh, overlap, uh, you know, military families or military spouses making use of, of DAS uh, programs, um, making use of the DAS library, things like that. Um, there's no sort of formal uh, relationship, but, um, you know, it's, it's an asset, I think, to the German, um, excuse me, an asset to the American community in Stuttgart and uh, certainly one of my big goals when I was in Stuttgart was making sure more and more members of the military knew about it. Um, so what, uh, oh, so somebody has asked a question for, for you, Matt, here. So somebody uh, lived in, uh, in Louisiana and wanted to know, was there anything from Louisiana that you would have liked to have seen in Germany, like uh, some, maybe some good Cajun food or something like that? Well, I, I was born in Baton Rouge. Uh, I can I can throw down with Cajun food with anybody any day of the week, so I don't miss that because I can do it myself. I actually bought a very large uh, fryer so that I can cook gumbo outside and not make my house smell like a carnival. Uh, the only thing from Louisiana that I wish that I could see here are the, the Louisiana State University football team. <laughs> As Bill said, uh, I... I miss going to football games, but with modern technology as it is, I can always stay up until three in the morning to watch them play live. Absolutely. Um, so just another sort of shifting gears, we're going back and forth between the uh, the personal and the more professional here. Um, what, you know, Bill, if you had your druthers, if you could, you know, rule, rule you calm for a day, uh, what do you think you would do in terms of helping to bring Americans and Germans together more? Um, do you feel that maybe there was more emphasis put on joining the communities, you know, maybe during the Cold War? Um, or do you, and do you think that there's some programs that used to exist about bringing the communities together that might uh, be worth bringing back? Uh, my impression is there may have been. I, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, I do have uh, some some older Garrison newspapers in my archives, and it's interesting to kind of look back, and it seems like there may have been more of those opportunities uh, in the past. Um, and obviously, a lot of that's, you know, pre-9-11, and I think that was kind of really a, a defining moment for, you know, kind of pulling back on some of that for, for the reasons we've already mentioned. Um, so I, I think there might have been. I think too, honestly, uh, and we haven't really talked about it, the past two years of COVID have absolutely restricted so much more, even from my previous experience. And, I, and I've seen that happen with those opportunities uh, that we would have had to go off post if, have really kind of dried up. Um, so that's made it tough, I think. I, I really feel bad for the people that have moved here during COVID because mm -hmm. um, it's been really tough, you know, but they haven't been able to immerse themselves in quite the same way that, say, Matt and I have had when we've been here before. We got to see all the great things like Christmas markets and beer gardens and, you know, folks marches and everything else. So, you know, it's uh, I can only imagine, you know, what they're missing out on. And, and that's why I said I'm hopeful, uh, like doing the tour for the Feingen City Council and those kind of other opportunities for outreach. I th I'm hoping we'll see that come back because I think that'll kind of uh, bring back some of what, what was missing. 
Yes, you're absolutely right. My my family um, were in Germany, in Stuttgart from 2018 to 2021. And so COVID hit kind of midway through. And I will say, you know, I enjoyed the Christmas markets. You know, if I could have done 22 Christmas markets, I absolutely would have. And that was for me like, oh, that was a, just an actual dagger to the heart when they canceled the Christmas markets. And the, uh, I, I mean, almost worse than when they canceled Kanstattavassen. <laughs> that was, uh, that was terrible. Um, there's a question, if you don't mind answering, Matt, about uh, the housing market. You mentioned the possibility of buying um, in Germany. Is that something that um, maybe housing market wise, is that hard? Uh, you know, is, have you seen that change a lot in terms of actually looking to buy here in Germany? Yes, the, the house that we lived in before um, in 2013 our, the land, the landlady wanted to sell it to us, and the price that she, the price that she asked to me at the time seemed silly. It seemed really high, and now I look at it and think, wow, that would have been such a steal. Uh, when we first arrived last May, we actually spoke with a German loan officer and started the process of looking for a house. We were we're living in suitcases and had been living in suitcases already for a month or so as we're transiting our house in Texas and staying in hotels, and now we're staying in a hotel on the base. And the, those lo lodgings were fine, but eventually a family of five needs to have a little bit more space than just a hotel room. And the gentleman that we were speaking with told us that we were looking at, the process was going to be a minimum of six months to a year. And the areas in which we wish to live, um, he was not very hopeful that we were going to find anything. So we still keep our eyes open. Um, but right now we're just, we're really enjoying our relationship we have with our landlords and with our, our beautiful village. Absolutely. I think that, uh, Bill, as you said, the housing search in, in Stuttgart can be very hard even just to rent um, when you are out on the economy. Um, there was a question about whether or not uh, soldiers, airmen, Marines need to learn the language uh, when they're coming to Germany. Um, I mean, in, in my experience, that's not required. I mean, in certain positions, you might be trained in German. But uh, what do you think, Bill? Have you ever heard of many people that uh, take German classes or are required to do so? Um, I don't know about being required to do so. Uh, I'm familiar with a, a newcomers program that I first went through in Italy that incorporated two days of Italian. I did not have the same experience when I came to Ramstein and I have not had that here. So to seek out uh, language instruction on my, it would be uh, something you'd have to do on your own. And, I, and I've done that, um, not to, to the extent that I feel that I probably should have, <laughs> but enough to get by, I think, I hope, um, or at least, uh, you know, at least make it uh, definitely a part of the experience, but I'm not aware of any mandatory requirements, although, you know, there's something to be said for that based on my, like I said, very limited time in, in the Italian course. I think it helped a lot. Uh, Matt, sprechen Sie Deutsch? Ein bisschen. <laughs> Enough yeah. to get myself in trouble. I, yeah, I've, I've not had it, uh, same as, as, as Bill said, I, I've not heard of it as a requirement. I, I would encourage it just to the basic phrases so you can get by. Ich verstehe ein bisschen Deutsch. Kann es English? Just enough to say, hey, I, I'm doing my best here. Can you meet me? <laughs> um, but the, the, I think that's that's another barrier that a lot of the folks that choose to live on base or on post that, that just want to encourage them to get over that because uh, it's the, the community around the area, the surrounding area, excuse me, is very is very open and, and, and able to communicate with you. So just be brave and get out there. Well, someone asked a follow up for you, Matt. How do you how do you make that work when you're uh, communicating with your children's school? My wife handles that primarily, <laughs> and she she does a great job with that. I'll just say kudos to my wife. Yeah, uh, and I will say uh, from having uh, worked with my child's school as well, even though they they did make an effort for uh, bilingual parents, uh, Google Translate is a miraculous thing. <laughs> um, and how would you feel you've you know in the years since you've been here since two thousand five, you've always had a, a positive reception from Germans. 
I have. Yeah, it's always it's always been a, a good relationship. And I've, I've never run into I have never personally run into any problems anywhere I've lived or with any of the events that we've supported. Uh, done a lot of support with the Bundeswehr as well. And it's just it's always been a very amicable relationship, friendly. Um, and you can see I, I don't know if the audience knows this. This is the German marksmanship award. Um, I received this uh, about 10 years ago. I actually we we were deployed to Afghanistan and doing some troop support there and we're playing for a battalion of German soldiers and made a great connection with their commanding officer. And when they redeployed, meaning when they came back to Germany, they had my group, my team come and play for that event and continued this relationship. We were invited out to participate in the marksmanship um, process with the Bundeswehr. And at the time, a lot of army soldiers wear this award, but it's it's a, at the time it was a rarity with the with Air Force members, and I wear it proudly because of the relationship and the friendships that I have with those individuals and maintain maintained contact with that particular German uh, commander for several years. Uh, Bill, could you speak a little bit more about, you know, for a person who's perhaps never visited a base or done a tour uh, like the one you were referring to, what might a person expect to see um, if they were visiting a U.S. base? You know, maybe you could speak a little bit about, you know, there's always a bowling alley, that kind of. <laughs> uh, they're very much uh, miniature communities, uh, probably some more than others. Uh, and. Uh, having been to Ramstein, uh, I know that's a very large community. Uh, imagine, especially now, uh, an airport with a hotel, with a very large mall, with a gas station, with a swimming pool, with a bowling alley, with a, a whole host of other facilities uh, uh, all contained within that Ramstein footprint, you know, one base. Uh, a little bit different here in Stuttgart because they are smaller uh, garrisons, uh, essentially pre-World War II uh, constructed facilities that have been adapted over the years. So it's a little bit more dispersed. So those same services are offered, but they're in different places. Uh, but generally there's some some similarities, you know, with facilities that are offered yet. very much a, a community. Like I said, the, the one Feingen uh, council member, you know, when she kind of saw that it was still the same as it was back in the nineties, you know, the, okay. <laughs> so maybe it's not all that, all that interesting, but um, yeah. And I, I don't know if you can uh, speak to this, Bill, or, or would know anything about it. I remember when I uh, visited Heidelberg, um, I saw that there had been some facilities there in Heidelberg that were now being transitioned over into sort of a multi-use housing entertainment district. Um, can, can you speak at all to sort of the afterlife of bases that uh, no longer are being used by Americans? I think the, that's a good example. Um, even at Robinson Barracks here in Stuttgart, there's a portion that used to be a part of the, the military, um, within the military boundary that's now uh, revitalized housing for the Stuttgart community. And I'm absolutely sure that's the case for, for lots of other former, particularly army facilities, more so than say Air Force. Um, of course, now we have uh, Han Airport, used to be an Air Force base uh, up in the, the, you know, north of Ramstein. And um, Zweibrücken is another airport that used to be an Air Force base. It also has a big outlet mall there. So there's a lot of repurposing uh, that's gone on in various, in various ways, so. And I think you were mentioning that it's, it's not really typical for the bases that we have to expand much um, is it like to, to grow their footprint? I think that's generally true. I'm not aware of any large expansion of any footprint. They have to kind of make do with what's there. And that's certainly the case on the facilities here, you know, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't give you every single example, but I think that's true. Yeah. And, um, Matt, do you get a free flight home? Somebody wants to know to the U S once a year for, for family purposes. And do you take advantage of that? I do not. And um, so, no, we do not get free flights back to the States. We do have what's called Space A, where if we are on leave, we can then try to sign up for those flights. To my knowledge, those have been closed due to COVID. And so I, I have personally in my career never done a Space A flight. 
my wife has on a few occasions been able to take advantage of that when I've been deployed. And uh, we're very fortunate that there, she would be able to catch a flight from Ramstein Air Base and it would go directly into Baltimore International Airport. And her parents live only 20 minutes away from Baltimore Airport. So that's that was a godsend back in the 2010 to 13 assignment. Uh, deployed a couple of times during that period of time. And during those periods, she was able to go back home to be with her family. Um, but no, I don't, I don't get an annual free flight home. And I've, I, honestly, I've told my family and my friends that unless I absolutely have to go back home for a funeral, please come visit me because I'm not coming back home in the next three years. This is, this is it. I think my family said much the same. Um, uh, very quickly, somebody had a question about access to the bases and if bases being more open in the U.S. than they are over here. I, just from my perspective, I would say base access is is pretty restricted in the U.S. too. You you need to have a military ID, um, and that's how you get on. Um, okay, so I wanted to uh, take one more go at a more personal side. What is on your bucket list um, for the remainder of this particular assignment to Germany? I know, Matt, you're saying you're you're hoping to make this your, your forever home eventually, but do you have a bucket list, things you haven't done in Germany yet that you really hope to do? Wow. Well, it's just, it's such a different assignment now, right? I mean, the last time, the first time I was here was just me. The second time we left with a six month old and now we have, we have a full family of little peacocks and that we're chasing around after. Um, we, this, this past year in November, we surprised our children with a trip to Euro Disney. Um, and so now we're just trying to find opportunities when we can go and do day trips to go to the new Schweinstein castle so they can see that. I mean, I've got two little Disney princesses in my house. I want them to get to see and experience that. Um, we live, we live very close to Saarbrücken. So we were able to, they, they got to see Santa fly across the city center last at the Christmas market last year. So just really wanting them to take advantage of all, all that is around us. Um, we took them to the black forest uh, down in, in Treburg. And so they got to have the original Black Forest cake. We took them to a master craftsman there that built the cuckoo clock that we had commissioned and got to see him again. So my wife and I have so many treasured memories and we just want our children to, to get to see and do that. And there's so much history in this beautiful, wonderful country that we want our children to, to get to experience. So everything is on the bucket list. Nothing is off of it. And already as, 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 Bill mentioned, you know, COVID has still robbed us of so much and being here for a year now and just a few, a few very small trips uh, to get to see and do. So really hoping that they'll get to, that we'll get to go to Bad Durkheim and, and participate in those festivals and, and all the festivals in the surrounding area. We have one of our commentators making a pitch to make sure you, you go to the North as well. They oh. Of course, of course. Yeah. I, I will say I did have tickets booked to Hamburg during COVID times that I had to give up. And again, that was very, very, very sad for me. Um, how about you, Bill? Do you have a, a long bucket list that still has a lot of ticks to mark off? Well, I was going to say the north. That's uh, the region of Germany I've, I've spent almost no time in, unfortunately. So yes, Lee, trying to go to those portions that we have not been to. We've done everything that Matt uh, just talked about. I have an older daughter. She's going off to college this summer. And so my wife and I are considering trips by ourselves <laughs> for the first time uh, in a while. So the, we're kind of looking forward to maybe those opportunities. Uh, we still have another daughter at home, but obviously, um, yeah, we've done a lot of those things that Matt uh, talked about and, and we still enjoyed it. We still love going back to some of those places. So I, I would agree with him. Everything's still on the list. You know, as much Soak up as much as we can because... Yes, we do feel like the last two years we've kind of not been able to to do what we wanted to do when we came back. Yeah, I remember reading. I I love um, tea. I was I was born in the UK, so I'm a big big tea person. And there are islands along the northern coast with, that specialize in a very particular kind of tea, apparently with this very thick cream. Uh, and that was something I really wanted to do. Okay, um, so I think that we are nearing the end of our uh, discussion. We don't have any pending questions at the moment. Was there anything that you folks have uh, felt that you might wanted to make sure that you uh, got to say that we haven't addressed? Any questions that you haven't been asked that you feel, I really want to make sure that people come away with this understanding? 
Bill, I'll start with you. Unfairly, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no, nothing to add really. Just uh, and have enjoyed my time here. Obviously, uh, have been back. Uh, you know, so uh, and the history is wonderful and fascinating. Obviously, from the military historian in me, uh, seeing a lot of what's transpired and being here to to kind of capture that uh, is really what makes part of the biggest part of my job so gratifying. And, and I think it's been part of the reason I've come back over here too. Well, if I could, if I could then rudely before I turn to you, Matt, ask a follow up. But you know, I I love history as well. You you say it's a you know obviously a big privilege uh, to be here in uh, in Germany. You know, what is it that makes it special as a historian? Uh, being in Germany, you know, like what what sort of time period in history is the most interesting to you, and how are you able to bring that into your work? Um, well, the it's the beginning of my briefing started with World War II and that period. Uh, that's a a seminal moment for a U.S. military historian, obviously, uh, because of our involvement in the world, really kind of changed things for the United States, uh, and it kind of has just kept going from that point, and, and just to kind of be here to continue. To witness that evolving story uh, that's what i'm saying that's the kind of the most gratifying part of that to kind of witness that continuing and that partnership you know um, america the united states of america is born uh, to a great extent because of europeans and then to kind of see that interaction coming back this way uh in the longer historical picture is also fascinating to me as well to kind of see that transatlantic uh, connection, you know, still evolving and, and still working at a higher level. <laughs> I know that's very kind of um, philosophical, but uh, it's it's really interesting. Yeah. And and Matt, how about you? What would you like to make sure that people come away with? Perhaps, uh, you know, the the unique mission of USA Fee Band or, you know, what would you like to make sure that, uh, that people walk away from this presentation knowing? Yeah, I just want to stress how special of an assignment this is and how privileged I am to have been stationed here three times and how much I appreciate the relationships that we have, the folks that are tuning in right now to, to learn more and, and just to build upon those, our relationships that we have with each other and our, our, our ally in Germany is just so important. And yeah, I just want to encourage folks to continue to reach out and be friendly to one another and, and I, you know, I keep, I constantly am telling my, my service members, my, my troops, my airmen, get out, do things, get out, do things. Don't just stay in your house. Don't just stay on the base, get out and do things. And the base does have a lot of different options and alternatives. Our RTT, one of our travel agencies, they're constantly doing tours. There's so much to see and do here. I've loved it. And if, if I could do everything over again, I would do it exactly the same just to have these experiences. That's wonderful. Thank you both. So I'm going to, I think, turn it back over to uh, John, who is then going to turn it back over to Marion to uh, end the presentation for the day. Is John still here? <laughs> it. He's coming. He's coming. <laughs> I can see the little, it's spinning. There he is. <laughs> Hi, exactly. Thanks a lot, Natalia. Thanks a lot, Bill. Thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, we touched on lots of topics. And then now I'm going to hand it over to Marion, who's going to uh, conclude the event today. Yeah, what an honor. I'm not sure if there's much to add. I just wanted also to say thank you to you. Um, everyone, of course, who participated, um, our panelists, uh, our moderator, but of course, also big thank you to everyone at home um, for asking all those uh, wonderful questions. Um, we, um, we are really glad that you join all of our events, and I hope that you um, can stay in touch, follow us um, you know, on our social media um, to see all of our upcoming events. Uh, it was great to be a part of this. John, thanks again so much for initiating it. And uh, everyone, just have a good night. And we hope to see you at one of our next events. Bye. <laughs>